Well, hi and welcome to DEC Online Service. And today I'm joined by Mr. Graeme Cross. Hello there. Hello there. How are you? Yeah, great. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And uh, Graeme is going to be speaking to us uh, in our continuing series on the book of Corinthians. A few difficult bits in there today, Graeme. Yes, I, I do make reference of and, and make a point of thanking you for uh, giving me this particular passage. Yeah, a certain, a certain set of verses in it are great. Yeah. Indeed, and um, I'm sure there's a bit of, ba bit of banter with Cathy about I them. I got some good guidance from my wife as to what I should say. <laughs> I'd say you did. Of course, I told her to be quiet and yeah. she should <laughs> submit to me, but it didn't seem to work too well. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, when I honestly, when I was given, you know, when I asked you to speak on that chapter, I, I didn't, I hadn't really read through it all and I wasn't yeah. entirely sure where we were going. But it's interesting, isn't it? And isn't it interesting to try and bring it into the 21st century yeah. and what it means for us today? I mentioned in it that the context is everything, right? I, I think we, we read a lot of passages in the Bible and they're taken completely out of step from, you know, from what's happening and from where they are. Yeah. Usually designed to cause trouble. Somebody's yeah. usually quoting them to, to cause a bit of trouble. Well, I mean, you think particularly about what Patrick talked about last week, you know, I mean, that, that, that chapter is, as he said, is read at every funeral or wedding, um, yeah. weddings particularly, and used in so many different ways, completely out of the context in which it was written, which was talking about spiritual gifts and the life of the church. And um, the same thing happens with uh, so many things, you know. In fact, at the end of the conversation that Patrick and I had last week, we were just talking about how freeing uh, Christianity was for women in the first century and how Paul was a bit of a hero to women. Yeah. Uh, but the attitude of the church changed by the third century and suddenly Paul becomes a misogynist. And, you know, um, you find that it's what we put back into it, our own presuppositions into the text before we even get to it, that causes us so many problems. And it does cause problems. It does, as well. Yeah. You know, I think it's... It's easy to be flippant about, you know, the context and, and, and that's everything, but it, it's, it's never used, really. Those statements and those verses are never used to cause harmony. Like, they're always, no. they're always used to try and cause a row somewhere. And, uh, I know. And if you want to cause a row, it's never too hard. No, it isn't. So, listen, uh, that's great. And I really look forward to um, listening to you in a few minutes. Thank time. you. And so we're going to go to worship song now, and um, then we'll be on to the kids' slot. Too late. 
And should this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has brought for me, both now and forever. God, you are so good. Well, good morning everyone. Hope you are doing well. Hope that you are like me and just enjoying the lovely weather recently. I have to say, I love this time of year, the late evenings, being out and about on the bike a little bit more, barbecues, I do, I love it. And you probably only have a few weeks left of school, so I hope you're counting down the days and that you get to do something nice over the summer, even though all the normal things that you may have enjoyed over the summer probably still aren't gonna be back, things like schism and whatnot but we hope that you do have nice plans for the summer. So anyway, let's keep going with what we're looking at in First Peter. Uh, and let me tell you just a little story from my life uh, in the last couple of weeks. I was speaking to a friend of mine, a very good friend, who is a personal trainer. If you don't know what that is, that is somebody who, I suppose, helps people kind of get fit, look after their bodies, and all those kinds of things. And I was saying to him, uh, I've noticed that as I've gotten older, I've lost particular parts of my body, but as I've gotten older, I've, well, maybe gained particular parts of my body and have maybe a little bit more surface area than I have, than I used to have. And when I run, my legs are okay, but because I don't run and, or because I run and don't do much with my upper body, I was saying to my friend, what can I do to kind of maybe just kind of look after myself a little bit more? And he gave me an answer which I wasn't really wanting to hear. And he said, I need to go and buy something. So I did. So he told me that I needed to get some of these bad boys. So hopefully you'll be able to see it from there. These are obviously weights. And the idea is, is that you lift them and you put them down and you do different things with them. And I hate lifting weights. I always have. But he said, if you're gonna wanna get rid of these bits that you're not too happy with, well, you're gonna have to actually do something about it. And he said, the best way to go about it is to be doing some work with weights. And where we've reached in the letter of First Peter is a little bit like this. Now, no, Peter doesn't tell the people that he's writing to to go and buy weights, but he does tell them that if they want to get rid of something, they're going to have to do something about it. Second Peter, or sorry, First Peter, chapter two. Peter tells them to rid themselves of malice and deceit and slander and all these different things. You see, what Peter is saying is that even in your new relationship with Jesus, where he changes your heart and you, you start to live towards him, there are things that just don't happen by magic. Like me, my kind of body's not going to just change by magic. I'm going to have to do some bits by it, to it. And Peter is saying the exact same thing. He's saying, you're going to have to do something in order to get rid 
of the bad habits that you want to change now that you're living your life towards Jesus. So if you pop over to Right Now Media, Phil is going to tell us a little bit more about this passage where Peter says, get rid of some of the stuff in your life that's just not good. I hope you're really enjoying working through the letter of 1 Peter. It's one of my favorite letters in the Bible. It's really helpful, really proactive, and really encouraging, and also helps us, uh, particularly uh, this week we'll see, it, it helps us to know some of the stuff that we've got to change as we live as Christians. So we'll see you soon. Hi everyone, and now I, like many of my friends, including the pastor beside me, are not very good rule followers. I get the need for them, for other people, because of the many silly things that they do, but they're not for me. I see them as getting in the way of innovation and progression. Maybe the best illustration is when we first adopted the kids. For me, I really struggled to see the point of routine. Kathy beat it into me that it was important, but I often felt like we had to interrupt a perfectly good day. The kids were happy, we had fun times, and then we had to get back home in time for naps, or my particular pet peeve, bath time and bedtime. In fact, I remember being out with them at the park, just me and the two kids, uh, Jamie and Lily, and I decided to miss nap time. There was no sign of the kids needing it, until they needed it. It was like someone flicked a switch and I ended up having to carry both of them all the way home from the park and they were very grumpy for the rest of the afternoon. I suspect many of you know what I'm talking about. I'll also not mention how happy Cathy was with the decisions I'd made. Of course, there does come a time when order is necessary. I think of large crowd gatherings such as schools, football matches, concerts, cinemas and theatres, etc. There have to be rules or we risk chaos and people feeling unsafe. And we know particularly all about that at the moment as places begin to open up. We have to have some kind of order and rule. There's also something really annoying about people who talk over a film or a play. Someone who constantly stands up in front of you at a match or decides that their commentary is much more important than what's going on on the pitch. Of course, that's not the case. There is a message, a narrative, an important teaching that has been prepared and is being delivered. The big danger is that unruly behaviour or even well-meaning exuberance can mean that that point is missed. We see the same in Corinth in everyday life. This is a cosmopolitan city where debate and excess is commonplace. It's a culture where everything is discussed in public and many philosophers are giving their view only to be upstaged by the next upstart who thinks that they know better than them. So it is with the new church in town. These Christians are teaching new ways of living, new future and a new message of hope. But there are lots of things to learn and lots of opinions to be heard. This is, after all, how Greece became such a great empire. So I'm just going to read the passage now. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 29 to 40. And I'm going to read from the message. So starting at verse 26. So here's what I want you to do. When you gather for worship, each one of you will be prepared with something that will be useful for all. Sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide an insight. If prayers are offered in tongues, two or three is the limit. And then only if someone is present who can interpret what you're saying. Otherwise, keep it between God and yourself. And no more than two or three speakers at a meeting, with the rest of you listening and taking it to heart. Take your turn, no one person taken over. Then each speaker gets a chance to say something special from God and you all learn from each other. If you choose to speak, 
you're also responsible for how and when you speak. When we worship the right way, God doesn't stir us up into confusion. He brings us into harmony. This goes for all the churches, no exceptions. Wives must not disrupt worship, talking when they should be listening, asking questions that could be more appropriately be asked of their husbands at home. God's book of the law guides our manners and customs here. Wives have no license to use the time of worship for unwarranted speaking. To you, both women and men, imagine that you're a sacred oracle determining what's right and wrong. Do you think everything revolves around you? If any one of you thinks God has something for you to say or has inspired you to do something, pay close attention to what I've written. This is the way the master wants it. If you won't play by these rules, God can't use you. Sorry. Three things then to sum this up. When you speak forth God's truth, speak your heart out. Don't tell people how they should or shouldn't pray when they're praying in tongues that you don't understand. Be courteous and considerate in everything. Paul, ever wise and always ensuring the church is allowed to function with one key message, that being the glory of God, sees the church in Corinth has gone a step too far. This is as much a problem of growth as it is of culture. Likely this active approach worked for smaller groups, 10 to 15 folks meeting at home and each has a chance to speak and each has a chance to listen and worship. However, we can assume that the church in Corinth has grown to meetings of probably around 50 to 100 people. And there simply isn't time in this format to cater for everyone speaking and then time to interpret and then time to worship. We cater for this active participation in connect groups in DEC. Time spent in smaller groups where our focus is on passages or topics or books um, or even what has been discussed at the weekend. And everyone gets an opportunity to actively participate. This is what works and gives people a chance to grow. We know that even Paul himself loves to instruct and debate, as we've seen from his many letters and his chats with his peers, questioning everything from circumcision to headdresses. However, he sees the congregation in Corinth overinvest in the debate and folks claiming to use their gifts from the Holy Spirit actually disrupting the key messages where they talk over each other and endlessly question things they don't understand. Doing this during what is supposed to be worship time and a time when they get a chance to praise God. A time when the church delivers the key messages that are relayed from God to his people and his people connect in a special and spiritual, God, uh, spiritual way with God through tongues and prophecies. These guys are missing that by concentrating on the wrong things or even actually the right things at the wrong time. There's always opportunity to privately pray with others, to give a blessing or a word to others before or after the service. It doesn't always have to be in the middle of it. I know the line in the, I love the line, sorry, in the message where Peterson says, if you choose to speak, you're also responsible for how and when you speak. Doesn't, God doesn't stir us up in confusion, but brings harmony. I think that's really important to understand that lots of words and lots of voices that speak up during the service don't always um, bring unity and aren't always of God. And it's a good way to test that. Paul is very clear on the purpose of the meeting from his perspective. In Ephesians 4.12, he tells the church that it is for the edification and equipping of the church so that they can minister and edify the body of Christ. So we come to the passage itself in a little more detail. It's often described as one at a time or take your turn, all things in moderation. Paul opens up with an invite to be prepared to share something in some format in order that the church may be built up. Do something, recommend a hymn, teach, talk in tongues, prophesy, but don't overdo it. Let two or three people speak in tongues, but only if it can be interpreted. Some may say this gift cannot be controlled, but of, of course Paul here lays out a guardrail. Only do it if it can be interpreted. Otherwise you can and should stay silent or keep it for a more private occasion. 
Of course, I agree with this, but one thing I want to say is I do sometimes wonder if tongues has become a tainted gift in the eyes of some Christians today. Some believe it's just babbling and isn't really a gifting, but an opportunity to show how gifted am I. And I've seen this as well at many meetings where you wonder, is it really um, tongues and is it really of God? Although this can be true, I'd say we should remain open to the gifting as it is a language to God and from God. And so, of course, it may appear incoher incoherent to us, but it can and should be interpreted. I would hate for us to go ahead and be afraid of the gift and in the end miss what is being said through it. Moving from tongues to prophecy, again controversial in some arenas. It's an easy thing to do, no one can prove them wrong, everything's about the future, I'll not be here to see whether it happens. Again though, the guardrails are there. As long as everyone is instructed or encouraged, not for your own enjoyment, and it is inspected, then it should be fine as well. In 1 John 4 verse 1, we see John say something similar. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. And in Gal Galatians 1.8, Paul also effectively says, test everything. In fact, he goes on to say, even if an angel from heaven came with a message, it must be tested. Not sure who would test it, to be honest, but um, that's also Paul's view. As Calvin also said, prophecy is the gift of explaining revelation. Therefore, it is subject to the judgment and comment of others. In these small meetings in Corinth, it was expected that somebody who spoke as a prophet would be subjected to the confirmation and correction, if and correction if necessary of others present. False prophets exist and will drive churches in the wrong direction. In fact, firsthand I've seen and heard our old pastor put down so-called prophecy in the church for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was a confusing message. And number two, it spoke of darkness in the church with no hope. And there was certainly nothing edifying in that at all. I was sat in the congregation and I can tell you there was certainly nothing that was building up the body of Christ in the message from the person who spoke out. And interestingly, we never saw that person in church again. So I'm not sure what their, their kind of motivation was there, um, but it was put down pretty quickly. Again, though, the gift is there for all and assigned according to God's requirements through the Holy Spirit. It is real. God is not limited to our minds and how we operate, and we should therefore still seek it and then test it. Paul is saying overall here, nothing trumps worship and the word when we come together. Our primary aim is to glorify God, to praise him, to build each other up and to praise God's name. We should not be going to church for entertainment or self-indulgence. The fact we get that at DEC is just a bonus. Paul has very specific reasons why we come together and I boil them down to two things. One, to build the church up and two, to build each other up. Edification. It's an interesting word and is defined as the moral or intellectual instruction or improvement of others. A lofty aim, but vital to both Christians' growth and the church's improvement. We come together to get built up so that we can go out to the world refreshed and renewed and ready to glorify God, ready to witness to others what it is to have everlasting hope and a salvation in Christ. I enjoyed reading the quote from Handel after his Messiah piece was admired in the local press. Lord Cunnell at the time said to him how great it was that he had entertained the town. Handel responded a bit surprisingly and I'd say Lord Cunnell was a bit taken aback. He said, my Lord, I should be sorry if all I did was entertain them. I wanted to make them better. It is to be feared that many speechmakers at public meetings could not say as much. And yet how dare any of us waste the time of our fellow mortals in, in mere amusing talk. If we cannot speak for their edification, how much better to hold our tongues. And maybe a little bit less delicate is Spurgeon's comment. Um, he had no truck with the fun lovers of the 1800s, but he basically said that spiritual self-indulgence -indulg is a monstrous evil. Paul talks all the way through the um, passage 
about taking action, being prepared. There is no doubting where he stands that the service is not for continuous feeding, but it's designed to grow your service to God. Set aside time to hear what God is doing and saying through others, but focus, focus and focus again and don't get ahead of yourselves and use the church meeting as a debating chamber or a place to be entertained. I sometimes find it useful to try and bring an analogy and I immediately thought of the UK Parliament in this instance. Have you ever seen those debates where it gets unruly? People talking over each other, individuals progressing their agendas, although often hilarious to hear the speaker be going, order, order, as he tries to bring everyone under control again. Sadly, it has happened while serious issues and messages have been presented and those are lost amongst the disorder. I think the Corinthians have this going on in smaller groups and that's why Paul is trying to bring into, um, into their meetings some order and some rules. Going back to the next section, I wanted to pause and thank Doogie for giving me this section around women and their role or not in the meetings. I shall metaphorically put my hard hat on and talk about how women should be silent in the meeting. Paul has often been described as misogynistic. But of course, if we take time to remember, he has already among Corinthians 11 verses 1 to 16 set the idea that women and men are equal. There is a concept of submission to authority for sure, but not because it's a man, more because of the role of the leaders. Paul also says at the start of this passage, brothers and sisters, each of you has a hymn, prophecy or tongue prepared. He is not saying women have no place in church. We also know that this and similar passages such as Genesis 3.16, where it says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, are used incorrectly to subjugate women and also undermine the biblical teaching on equality. I think it's too convenient and lazy theology to just take these verses out of context. <clears throat> It doesn't take into account the context and the new position in Christ that Paul also speaks of in Galatians 3, verses 23 to 29. In that passage, he talks about us being new creations. And in fact, he says, neither male nor female, but indeed we are heirs to God's promise. There's lots of commentary on this, but to paraphrase Scott McKnight, Genesis speaks of fallen humans seeking to control others in a fallen world with a fallen mindset. Newly created followers of Christ can find a better way in mutuality. Paul teaches us that we are all one in Christ. McKnight also goes further and says that when man seeks to control women by silencing them permanently in the church, we stand face to face with a contradiction of the very thing that the new creation is designed to accomplish, and that is to undo the fall. So if we continue with an, a, a fallen mindset, and we don't look to the new promises and the new messages um, that happen after Christ's death and resurrection. We're actually contradicting everything that is being taught. Instead here, Paul is saying rather simply and bluntly, the chatter and constant questions must stop disrupting the service and worship. Again, context is everything. Women were less well-educated, certainly in the nuance of language. They had no place and no standing in pagan worship. So this sudden elevation into the love of God must have been overwhelming. A chance to experience love and hope, a chance to be an equal part of worship, again was so radical. They had questions and needed help. Also, we know that in the Middle East culture, vocalizing questions in public is as normal as breathing. So to rein this in, Paul suggests that they speak privately to one another or ask their husbands, who certainly would have been more educated once they got home. So perhaps the key conclusion is this. Paul isn't denigrating women. He's not banning tongues or prophecy or indeed any gift. The simple message is come together, bring whatever you've received and share it publicly if you get the opportunity in the one or two that are allowed or selected but nothing, and I mean nothing, supersedes the word against which these gifts should be measured, and nothing is more important 
that them worshiping God in your get-togethers and as you come to praise him. And the idea is that you build each other up and the church as a whole up. I, for one, am really glad we have a mixed leadership here in our elders and directors. I'm glad we have both sexes preaching and I'm looking forward to coming together as church, albeit limited in numbers, to pray, read the word, take communion and praise the name of God. In an orderly fashion, of course. Guys, I want to thank you for listening. I hope you have a great week and I'll hand back to Dougie. So, to prayer, and here I am with Mervyn, who's going to lead us in prayer this morning. Thanks, Mervyn. You're welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, during the week, uh, well, uh, over a week ago, I received a, a, a text from a friend, and there was only one thing on it. Didn't say who it was from, 
sign it or anything, just one, 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 one word, and it was Nahum 1, verse 7. So uh, I looked it up anyway, and the verse reads, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Now, subsequently, uh, Sally was leading the Zoom prayer meeting, and uh, she read from Psalm 9. And there was a verse in that that jumped out straight at me, verse 9 um, in, in, in Psalm 9. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And these two verses sort of started <clears throat> a chain reaction and, and, and spring, verses sp sprang to mind uh, containing the same sentiment, so to speak, like God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And David says, you are my hiding place and so on. And then the New Testament, um, in Romans 8, uh, Paul talks at the end of all the things, uh, it includes trouble or tribulation, and um, uh, says that, uh, you know, he's persuaded that um, none of these things, including tr trouble, can separate us from the love of God that is toward us in Christ Jesus. Mm. And um, again, we've got the promise that he never leaves and he'll never forsake us. So I sort of take an encouragement uh, from that because one thing we were promised, and that is that we would know trouble. In the world you will have, uh, you will have trouble. And um, the earlier verses in Nahum actually are, are quite interesting because they refer to um, the Lord as being jealous, vengeful, wrathful, and his wrath being poured out like fire, which doesn't altogether speak of uh, what we would deem as a God of love. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, the very next verse says then, uh, the Lord is good. Bit of a, a change of tone, so to speak. Mm. And it's good, I think, to remind ourselves of the fact that we who were saved were by nature children of wrath, mm. dead in trespasses and sin, but the Lord is good, even when we were uh, children of wrath and dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive together with Christ, and by grace we've been saved, and this through faith in Jesus. So how amazing is the grace that has saved us, the free, undeserving gift of God. And there's a quote um, by uh, a guy by the name of Wayne, Wayne Jackson. And um, I'll just read it because I think it's worth it. The concept of God's grace is thrilling beyond words. It shines its brightness, however, um, against the seemingly dark background of another aspect of the Creator's nature, that of sacred wrath. <clears throat> he goes on to say, Divine wrath is the reflection of a deliberate and measured reaction of a perfectly holy being towards sin, a response that is entirely con consistent with the righteous nature of a loving God. But these are the words that struck me. Standing out against the darkness of sacred wrath is the dazzling concept of grace. Mm. Standing against the darkness of sacred wrath is the dazzling uh, concept of grace. So anyway, with that, let's pray. Yeah. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come, as always, to your throne of grace where we who are by nature, children of wrath may find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We come acknowledging with thankfulness that it is only because of the work of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, on our behalf, as you laid on him the iniquity of us all, that we have this privilege. And when we pray, we also acknowledge that we must pray not our will, but yours be done. So we ask your leading and the help of your Holy Spirit as we bring a request to you now. Firstly, Lord, we just ask for our country. <clears throat> we confess that more and more you are ignored, your laws flouted, and there's an ever-increasing number who deny even your existence. We pray for your church throughout the 32 counties of, our, of the country to be faithful, to bear strong testimony to the Lord, adhering to your word, and by its lifestyle, commend the gospel. You tell us that in the last days false prophets will come and we pray that your church 
may recognize these men or women when they, are, and when they arise and that they may be stopped. We pray for men and women of integrity in both governments and harmonious relationships between the two and the resolution of the present difficulties regarding the implementation of the, pre pre of the protocol. Lord, you know all about the problems we face just now. The chaos current caused by the cyber attack on the health service, its impacts in patients on patients, the pandemic and its consequences for businesses and individual lives, the speedy rollout of the vaccine, the homelessness, the housing shortage, and the problems of addiction and crime in society, to name but some. Please, Lord, give wisdom to our government and other relevant bodies as they grapple with these issues. Thank you for the help given to all the various charities who helped the needy during the uh, pandemic. Uh, we also remember the DCM uh, Lighthouse and the Anchorage and many other institutions who have helped. May they know your blessing and ongoing provision. Then, Lord, we pray for the wider world where there's so much suffering and in particular the dreadful situation between Israel and Gaza. Please bring lasting peace and comfort to also to all innocent victims of the bombing and shelling who are injured or have lost loved ones. We also pray for your church in Israel, that they may be truly united, whether Jews or Arabs, as they are one in Christ. May they indeed find you to be the good God, a stronghold in times of their trouble. We pray too for countries like India, where COVID is particularly rampant, and the countries where people are suffering because of war or famine, and the many millions of refugees, particularly children like those growing in number, hoarded together on the Mexican border. Lord, have mercy. And for your own people suffering for being Christian, we remember them before you and ask for grace and strength for them to cope and the release of those held captives. And finally, this morning, we thank you for the opportunity of holding open services in our buildings again. Thank you too for the online services and pray that your blessing may continue on both for the foreseeable future. And Lord, as things slowly become normal again, as an intergenerational inter and multicultural church, show us clearly how that new normal should be. And as we have particular concern for the upcoming generation of young people, how we to meaningfully reach them with the gospel in an increasing digital age and build them up in their faith. Please give special inspiration and wisdom in these matters. We thank you for all your goodness to us over so many years, and we desire, as, <clears throat> and we desire to be relevant and faithful to you in terms of our ministry going forward. Help us to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace as an intergenerational and multicultural fellowship of believers. Please grant your grace and patience to all those who are ill, and those who care for them, particularly mentioning Aidan in hospital and Persis and the family, and also those who are anxious and troubled, and those mourning the loss of loved ones. May we all remember that you, Lord, are good and are a stronghold in a day of trouble, and you know who make you their refuge. We offer our prayers and give you our thanks and praise in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank you for those words of encouragement and for your prayers, Mervyn. And thank you for joining uh, with us today at our service. Thanks for Graeme, to Graeme for uh, his words earlier. And so I pray that uh, you've uh, had a, enjoyed the service, that God has spoken to you, and uh, may you know his love and grace in the coming days until we see each other again next time.